Hi, everybody. Welcome for this new Jenkins infrastructure meeting. Um, so the first topic that I want to cover is this weekend is the FOSDEM, which is a major open source event for the Jenkins community. Um, we'll be there. And I'm planning to do some demo if people are interested. But basically, what I really want to highlight here is don't break things before this weekend because I don't want to have to deal with infrastructure issues um, over the weekend. So if you if you if you are afraid to change something, just hold on until Monday, and then we'll have plenty time to to fix um, every issues uh, related to infra. So don't 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 change major stuff. And if you want to demo something or learn something, uh, feel free to ask, and I can prepare that for this weekend. Um, we also have yeah. I just invite you to look at the first demo website uh, for any content related to that. Uh, and one last thing, um, I think it's worthwhile to highlight as well. Um, the first demo has a specific chat room. Um, so everybody can just join, create an account and talk. So if you don't know what you'll do on Saturday and Sunday, feel free to just install that um, application on your smartphone and participate with us um, if you are available. Um, at least to answer questions. So that was the first thing that I want to cover. Any question? Nope. And then let's continue. Um, the next topic is about rootless GNLP agents. So something that we, um, I would not say discover, but that we that we decided that we want to change just. We are building specific GNLP agent, Docker images agents for that we use on ci.jenkins.io. So those agents include Node, Python, Ruby. I mean, those are pretty generic images and they are usually running as roots. And so basically what we want is we want to have images running with Jenkins users using the UID 1000. And so Kara and Damien are, are working on that. Um, Something that they realized during the process that we were shipping a GNLP agent dash Alpine Docker image, which is um, which does nothing. I mean, it's just redundant with the default GNLP, uh, the default inbound agents. So the plan is to deprecate that specific image. Um, we'll communicate that on the mailing list, but basically if you are using it, uh, that's the right time to stop using it and to use an inbound agent. Um, we'll, yeah, we'll probably delete that image in the coming weeks. Um, and if you are relying on those GNLP agents, um, we also invite you to, 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 uh, to, to double check that you, if you need the root user or not. I mean, the root user is still there. Um, it's just that by default, it won't be the, the, the default user. So that's it. Um, any question, anything to add? No. Um, the, la the next topic is about Jenkins infra chart. So what I want to highlight here, so we made, we made a few refactoring to the, um, one of the tool that we use on that Git repository, which is update CLI. And basically it broke the pipeline since Friday. So we have many ongoing um, change that need to happen. Um, we were waiting for the release to happen today, uh, which is done now. So we'll probably try to re-enable the job again, but um, yeah, there are, there are many PRs. So feel free to review them and um, and otherwise, uh, we'll apply them in the coming days. But again, we'll try to pay attention to not introduce major changes. So if you detect something that will be a major change, feel free to put the label on old with a few with a comment basically saying what why you suspect something dangerous there. Um, it's always useful. Um, um, I think all is said. Um, the next topic, which is, so Damien started looking at deploying a Kubernetes cluster on our Amazon account. So the idea would be to use that Kubernetes cluster just for Jenkins agents from CI to Jenkins.io. So Damien wrote the Terraform code to deploy that. Um, he, he built a specific Docker image containing the Terraform um, version that we need needs. Um, so there is already a Git repository. If I remember correctly, it's a Jenkins infra slash um, AWS, like the same pattern that Jenkins infra slash Azure. 
Uh, so feel free to make any comments there. The plan here is just to use it to replace the Azure Container instances. So we will we will just provision we will just configure specific um, agents on CI the Jenkins .io that we just provision um, pods on that cluster. Um, so more testing in the coming week. And the last topic that I put, I mean, for me to the agenda was uh, a few few things regarding Serverion. So we had issues, uh, we had issues with Serverion. So Serverion is one of the mirror um, that we are using in the infrastructure since um, many years now. Um, they had hardware issues during the month of December. Um, they put that mirror on maintenance. Um, they've solved the hardware issue one week ago. And we had a second thing with that specific mirror, which is they, they, are, they were using um, an IP um, from the United States, even though the cluster, the, the server was running in Netherlands. So we asked the mirror maintainer to use a different IP. So um, so mirror bits could detect the right location for the server, um, but apparently it took more than a day to update the DNS records. Um, so we temporarily disabled Serverion. Um, I documented the procedure to disable that mirror again in the future. So normally someone else should be able to disable it more quickly. We still have to put in place monitoring for every mirrors. Um, so if someone is interested to contribute to that, I can show how. Um, it's not, not really complicated um, as long as you know where to look. Um, and so, yeah, so normally everything should be back now. I have to, to double check the state of the DNS records. And if it's working correctly, we'll probably just put it back to the pool. So, so we had some very high visibility failures due to the Serverion server. I'm really worried about putting it back online. I'm my trust level in Serverion's ability to manage that thing has has decreased. Uh, <clears throat> that's a terrible thing to say, but but I'm I'm worried about them. So, you, is it is it online now, Olivier? Or is it so still... as far as uh, I mean, last time I checked, that was the, the server was online. Um, so I they don't have they don't have any. So for me, it was working correctly. So when I did the what? test last Friday, it was working um, as expected. What what Garrett highlighted uh, over the weekend was the DNS record that points. So the DNS record was flapping between the old IPs and the new IPs. So sometimes you were target, you were uh, going to the new IP, sometimes to the old IP, which obviously can generate some um, connection issues. Um, so my the way I would proceed, I mean, there is no reason now that um, there is no reason that it's down again. So um, I I would put that mirror to the monitoring so we could identify the response time. And so if we detect any high response time or issues, we, we can just easily disable. Uh, it's just one comment to run. Um, we have people on different time zones. So I think it's just a matter of can we identify mirror issues soon enough so we can disable it. I think it was the, the TTL on the zone record was set too high. So it's just not propagating fast enough. So some, not all, not all DNS sort of relays um, correctly adhere to the TTL anyway. But yeah, yeah. The, when I checked, I think the TTL was one hour. But again, not every DNS the DNS server handled TTL correctly and. From my experience, each time you change the DNS record, it's always um, it always leads to errors, and especially considering the amount of Jenkins instance relying on that mirror. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the the, G, the incorrect GOIP already made it complicated because it meant major Jenkins users on the eastern coast of the United States were going to that location. And, and we had one very, very high visibility person, um, Martin D'Anjou, who, who he's based in, in French Canada, uh, you know, so Quebec area. And he had major failures because Severian was unreliable. And, and that's a, for me, that's an awkward thing to, 
to have somebody that's that significant contributor broken by infrastructure that it's fairly safe to just disable their server as a mirror for the short term. So just 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 so, to, so that you know, I have to double check because right now I'm running some DNS queries and it's still flapping. Oh, it is. Okay, so there's a risk that it's because if it's flap and, and I those DNS queries. I don't think we're monitoring those, right? That's a, a facet of operations that I've never monitored before is, 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 are we getting DNS flapping? The thing, the tool that Gareth highlighted is something I've never seen before. It looks like a brilliant tool. But what surprised me is that the, the TTL is one hour. Yeah. So, so I, I have to send an email to that mirror maintainer again. Yes, and yeah. I also have to be sure that the TTL is honored by all the the client DNS and relay in your stack. In particular, if we have Alpine image in the in the equation, this could be troublesome inside Kubernetes cluster. Um, so here I will vote for removing the mirror for now. And then if we have to put it back, just to be sure that we first implement a way of uh, putting it outside of the uh, load balancer or whatever we use. I don't know, or at least have a way to measure if it's okay. So monitor the DNS request and also the IP, which is answered every hours. And if we have a mechanism to alert us or uh, remove at least automatically the server from the pool. We won't, we don't have, I mean, we, 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 we could implement that, but we yeah. don't have the time to work on that, so. Okay, so um, because I agree with Mark that the risk here is, is quite high. So better to but the risk is still, is still there. Yeah, the risk is still there. I'm I'm testing with the with the Google DNS and still flapping. So I have to send an email to see what's so, going on there. Maybe. So, but but if it's flapping, doesn't that lobby that we should disable it and admit it's it's that... already it's already disabled oh, anyway. Okay, all right. So it's you're just not going to enable it. Great. That that's, uh, that's perfect because that says just like your your argument was earlier that we should. Things that we worry about, we should not implement before FOSDEM. This is one for me. We should not enable Cerverion's mirror until after FOSDEM when we can look at it in more depth. Yeah, um, I'm double checking that now and it's definitely disabled for now. Perfect. That, that covered my worry then. So long as, so long as we're not, not relying on that server between now and FOSDEM, I'm happy. No, no, that's fine. And also, one something I don't know if you missed that information. You don't need a Kubernetes access to disable mirror bits, so you need a mirror bits client with the right configuration. So if you can manage to have the so basically the configuration is stored in a Redis database. So either you access the Redis database and you manipulate the Redis database, which sounds like awful, but um, if you have the configuration file, you can just uh, run mirror bits command pointing to the right configuration. And then you can provide commands like list mirrors, edit mirrors, and, and blah, blah, blah. And because of the outage we had back in November, a package that origin the Jenkins.io also have also has the, the configuration in the slash apt directory. So that, that could be an option in last resort. Um, we are, yeah, we are still on time. Um, next topic, which is, um, Oracle for startup by Mark. Yeah. So I, I was being asked by Oracle, Hey, have you registered for Oracle for startups? And so I just went ahead and registered with my credit card. Uh, I know Olivia, you and I had talked about, could we please register with another card? I haven't done that. Uh, I also haven't done any experiments yet with Oracle for startups to see what it would mean. After FOSDEM, my first thought of an experiment is to use their Phoenix data center as a mirror, but that may be a too dangerous a thing that would give us a mirror that's closer to the US West Coast and, and give us a ex chance to experiment with Oracle's infrastructure. Uh, I'm open to others though. We could also try different things. It's right now the thought is they're willing to give us a 75% discount on infrastructure. And I'm interested to see if it could help us or not. So what I propose is to, we, maybe we can plan a session together and we just deploy mirrors. Um, that, that would be a simple service to deploy um, that do not rely on specific uh, cloud vendor. And um, 
<laughs> because that's... there is already a home chart for that. So excellent. Well, and that that sounds really good because I've understood that Oracle's bandwidth charges are less than other vendors. And so that that makes it a little more attractive. If their bandwidth charges are lower, that could be a win. And if you want, if you um, yeah, maybe not in fact, I, I was suggesting maybe we can also deploy in the same region than the Azure cluster. But the problem is because we have a mirror running on the Kubernetes cluster, we have azure.mirror.azure.jenkins.io, uh, mirror but it would be difficult to identify the traffic specific to the azure.mirror uh, versus all the other services running on that cluster. But yeah, anyway, um, I propose that we plan a session next week. Um, but once once you start, once you create the accounts, uh, we should use it because usually they don't sponsor for years, basically. Right. Yep. And that's all I had on that topic. So, so basically, the way sponsoring work is when you create an account, they usually say um, they offer you sponsoring for one year, two years, three years. And the problem is, and in this case, two years, the problem is if you create the account and don't work on that for six months, um, the day you work on the account, you just lose six months of sponsoring. So that's why I'm saying if you enable it, you should start using it. Um, and the last topic to the agenda, which is the Jenkins release, the latest Jenkins weekly release is done. So the good thing is Garrett, your change did not break the release process. Boop, boop, boop. I was I was sincerely worried. I thought, oh my, I, last night was code reading. Oh, but what if this? Nope, it worked flawlessly. At least I'll have uh, a uh, checklist, but well done, Garrett. I thought you were very brave to merge it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been monitoring the uh, IRC channel all day, just just in case. <laughs> so, so just for the people who don't know what we are talking uh, here, um, so I did the first version. I did the first Python script to detect what's the latest version. It was working for weekly releases, but it was not working for stable releases. That's the first thing. The second thing is that Python scripts um, needed to be used from different location. And because it was a Python script, it put a strong requirement in having a Python environment. Um, and so basically what Garrett did was to rewrite the script that I wrote initially in Colang. So it's smaller. Um, it's a small binary that we can use, I mean, from everywhere. So we just download the binary, binary and then we can use it. And also it supports the stable release uh, version which means that for stable release, we could simplify the number of, by one the number of steps that we have to do for a new release. So yeah, that's that's a nice improvement. And obviously you can use it outside the Jenkins project because it's just uh, just a way to, to know the latest version. So I think it, yeah, every person monitoring Jenkins version could use it. Um, yep, any other topic that you want to bring here before we close the meeting? I mean, it does not make sense to take 30 minutes if we cover what we have to cover in 20. So thanks for your time and see you later. Bye-bye.